All right. Good morning, good afternoon. Welcome to our webinar today. I think we'll give it maybe one more minute and let people continue to join. It seems like people are still, still getting connected. So we'll give it one more minute before we actually get started. All right, well, it looks like we got a quorum, Ted. So I'll go ahead and kick this off. Um, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Happy Friday. I am Tracy Poland. I'm the Vice President of Marketing here at Infinicept. And um, we are so happy to have so many people joining us today to talk about payments. Um, we've had actually a huge response to this webinar and you know, we'll continue to run it as, as long as people are interested in it, um, but super excited today to get it started. Um, this is the first in a series of webinars that we're doing. Um, and this one is focused on payments, uh, Payments 101 to be, to be exact. Um, so that's what Ted's gonna be talking about today. I'll be monitoring questions. So please, if you have any questions, um, put them in the Q&A and we'll get them answered for you. And I think right now I'll just turn it over to Ted and um, let him get started. And I'm gonna actually go off camera so that you guys can focus on Ted's smiley face. Ted? Great. Thanks, Tracy. Um, it's great to be here today. I'm so glad uh, we have a lot of people have joined us. Um, the purpose of this webinar today is to talk about the payments ecosystem. Uh, so we call it Payments 101, but really we're talking mostly, our, our focus mostly is about um, software platforms and how to serve um, uh, credit card and debit card processing within a platform. So this, this ecosystem is really important. It's complex, especially when you're talking about payment platforms and it's been evolving. Um, there are established players um, and there's some new models that we want to explain. And uh, to succeed, it's really important to know all the players and the roles that people play. Uh, so the agenda, we're going to talk about some growth trends, uh, why these software platforms are important, uh, the who's who of payments, uh, some old models that are, that are really dying, that are being abandoned, and some new models that are emerging. So this um, data here is from a McKinsey study, um, and it shows something that is not surprising, especially uh, due to the last couple of years we've had with the pandemic, that digital commerce revenue is growing fast, expected to grow 22% um, even after the pandemic. Um, if, if there is an after the pandemic, um, it's, the digital commerce is going to grow and physical commerce revenue will retract. So this is, this is about the revenue that companies are making on um, a digital or physical commerce. Another um, piece of information they provided is that value-added services are a key driver of this digital commerce growth. And that includes things like fraud mitigation, buy now, pay later services, uh, card issuing, um, small business lending. Um, those are value-added service that can be added on to payments. Um, and that companies providing a better merchant experience are expected to win. They're going to take more market share. Next piece of information um, provided by McKinsey here is that 76% of the payments revenue growth is happening in the small and medium enterprise market. So um, that it's that small, that the long tail of the market that's really growing fast and there's a lot of revenue opportunity for providers to serve that market. Traditionally, um, merchant acquires and ISOs we're serving small merchants, but that of course was very heavily physical merchants, which we know is going down. Um, and they're not as well equipped to serve the evolving needs of digital payments. So um, with that, embedded payment providers are, are emerging and really providing the most scalable solutions for this fast growing small medium enterprise market. So let's talk about who's in this ecosystem, the who's who of payments. 
So this is definitely 101 content. Um, everyone should know the card networks. They create the rules that everybody uh, plays by. Uh, so everyone in the ecosystem follows the rules set up by uh, Visa and MasterCard. Um, we, have, we have a question here. Um, if we can uh, pause here, let's see if there's a way to, uh, Tracy, are you able to read the question or see what it is? Um, I just see a raised hand. Oh, just a raised hand. So yeah. I guess we... I guess we'll I guess we'll we'll wait to see if there's a uh, uh, typed in question. Okay. Um, so so the card networks, an important part of this ecosystem, they set the rules. Issuing banks, um, that's who the consumers, the consumers bank gives them a debit and credit card. Acquiring banks are the banks of the merchant. Uh, that's where the merchants um, put their money. Uh, payment processors came into the picture um, to help um, manage the transactions and the settlement between the issuing and acquiring banks. And then this last one, the merchant acquires and embedded payments providers is a big topic. That's why it's the biggest box. Um, they do a lot of miscellaneous things. It's the hardest to define. Um, and it's the area where there's a lot um, evolving. So we'll go into that in more detail. So one by one here, the card networks. Examples are American Express, Discover, MasterCard, Visa. They provide the infrastructure to clear and settle transactions. They manage the interchange system and set the rates for, um, for what, what things cost. Let's see if I get this. Uh, OK. And um, they promote the brand recognition. You don't know where you could use your card if there wasn't this um, network branding. Um, and they develop new products, um, help with security, drive card gro use growth. Um, things like the payment facilitator model actually was something that they put in place um, because of this trend of embedded payments. They establish the rules. Um, they manage compliance. So they, they are the police of payments, you could say. Next, the issuing banks. So they are an important player um, contracting with uh, the consumer. Um, you sign up to have a debit card or a credit card. There are terms. You may pay um, a fee for that or maybe included with your banking services that you get. Um, they settle with the networks. And you, of course, um, the, the issuing bank is reimbursed by the cardholder. You have to pay your credit card bill every month um, or you have money in your debit account. Um, they receive, they get paid by interchange fees from the acquiring bank. So that is how the issuing and, and different cards actually cost different amounts. So um, if you get rewards points, airline points, cash back, things like that, those are usually, those are given to the consumer by the issuing bank, but it's most likely paid for by the acquiring bank in terms of higher fees that they pay. So this part of the whole ecosystem of how it works between, between the banks, the cardholders, and the uh, merchants. Now the acquiring banks. So um, this is a very specific term I'm using, acquiring bank, not an acquirer. Um, and, and you're gonna, you hear that a lot in the industry. People talk about acquirers. Oh, I'm an acquirer, they're an acquirer. Lots of different companies can call themselves acquirers, um, but there is a very specific role of an acquiring bank um, that, that is, is a defined term. And it's, it's, identif it's regulated, um, it's identified by Visa and MasterCard with their BIN and their ICA. Um, they may sponsor agents, other companies like processors, ISOs, Payfax, who go by the term merchant acquirer or, or an acquirer. So, you, so it's good to be aware that there are those two levels. There's an official acquiring bank, and then there are all these other companies that can work on behalf of the acquiring bank. They call themselves acquirers. And they uh, manage and carry all the risk associated with the transactions. You could say the buck stops there. The acquiring bank is the merchant's bank, and um, that's who holds that risk for the transaction. Now, the payment processors are next. 
So payment processors provide the support and processing to move data between issuing and acquiring banks. They offer this connectivity, the networks for authorization, um, and the clearing and the settlement, the, the front end and the back end of, of transaction processing. Um, they have uh, different levels of back office support um, for the acquiring banks and the issuing banks. Um, and they have agreements uh, with those banks to provide certain service. Um, and lots of, a whole variety of models of revenue share and, and however they want to work with the acquiring banks and the issuing banks. So um, another, another thing to note is that the processors have gateways, which is a, a technical platform that a merchant or um, any kind of software has to code to, to get the transactions um, into the network, to get the transactions to the processor. And so they offer their own gateways. They're also third-party gateways. And um, there are pros and cons. Uh, there are definitely pieces that um, if, if, a, um, if you use a processor's gateway, it's more integrated into their overall service, but a third party gateway gives uh, people more choice as to, as to how they're going to direct their transactions, more control. That gateway um, provides the tokenization and encryption of the transactions. So um, I'm putting that here in the category of payment processors because it's part of that infrastructure. Okay, now the big category, merchant acquirers. Lots of people can call themselves acquirers. And there's this new category called embedded payments. And these are the companies that connect the merchants to the ecosystem. And it could be, it could be a uh, payment processor doing this, and it could be an ISO, it could be an aggregator, a marketplace, a payment facilitator. Um, these companies sign up merchants to accept the payments and they perform some underwriting, KYC. They have to know who the merchant is to let them into the ecosystem. And that responsibility falls to whoever's closest with the merchant. Um, they bill the interchange other fees. So they, they create the, the, the rate um, to charge the merchant. And that's typically called the discount rate. That's that percentage uh, or the rate that they, they charge for, for the credit and debit card processing. Um, they have to have an agreement with an acquiring bank. So there is no such thing as being, um, being an acquirer or an embedded payment provider without having an agreement with a sponsor bank or an acquiring bank. Um, sometimes the, the acquiring bank is the acquirer because they, they can do this also. Um, and uh, so, so there are a variety of players in here. One more thing on this is you, this term embedded payments. I wanted to introduce that, that concept. You probably heard a lot about this, this term embedded payments out there, blogs and articles. And it, it, the, the, the definition really is, and the way that we think about it at Infinicept, is it means that you have end -to -end, an end-to-end -end payment solution uh, within a software platform um, that is part of the entire experience of using that software or using that solution. And that includes um, the application to, to sign up for the processing. It includes the, um, the customer support. It includes the onboarding. Um, it's, it's like a holistic um, embedded payment solution that's part of the software not what you, the original model of integrated payments, which was just plugging in um, the payment functionality within software. So integrated payments have been around ever since the, the internet was created and software was created, um, but it wasn't really embedded in core, a core part of the software. So that's, that's how I like to think about it. It's beyond just accepting card payments and getting them somewhere, that's an integrated payment. An embedded payment is when it's really part of that functionality um, that you're delivering to the merchant, to, to your client. So let's look back at some of these, these other payments models that have been around for a long time. Um, one of them is the ISO model, independent sales organizations. Uh, this model originally, uh, it's probably 30 some years old, uh, provided the acquiring banks and the processors access to markets that they couldn't 
otherwise access or support. So niche markets of, of merchants um, that, that the uh, sales force of the, of the processor uh, really couldn't reach. And so these sales organizations helped them by reselling their service. Um, now those markets are actually being served better with software. So software is the vertical, it's the thing that reaches every niche of the market because just about every business uses software to manage it. So companies are finding that they value that software relationship more than a reseller or middleman, which is what the ISOs were. ISOs are, they're, they're dying. They're, they're going away. They're, they're, they're struggling to, to grow and to gain more clients because software is really serving that more important role. The next one um, that is being abandoned the model is the merchant of record aggregator. So this was where a company would say, hey, I have a merchant account. Um, I have a B2B software platform. I'm going to process the payments for all my clients. And then I'm going to settle uh, the funds and, and transfer, transfer the funds to each client. Um, this is actually, this model violates the card brand rules and should not be used. So it, it would not be wise to start a business and use um, the merchant of record um, model uh, because it, it, it won't last, it'll get shut off, it's, it violates the card brand rules. They, they, instead of this merchant of record model, they've introduced, the, the, card, the card networks introduced the payment facilitator model, which has more structure, more accountability, more controls checks and balances. So be aware if anyone says, hey, um, yeah, we're just using the merchant of record model uh, to take the payments and fund. Um, that's not going to that's not going to fly. And the final model that is being abandoned, uh, and we see this regularly, people coming to Infinisap to talk with us, they, they don't like the referral model. The referral model is the original um, integrated payments. Um, it's where a software platform um, needs their clients to be able to accept payments. So they say, hey, every single client, go get an account with a processor or an ISO. You hand them over, throw them over the wall. Um, that other company, that third party company handles the application, the underwriting, the onboarding, everything. And it is typically slow and disjointed. It doesn't scale well. And you lose control of your customer because you're handing them over to somebody else. So that's why um, th this model is, is falling out of favor. It's being abandoned uh, for other embedded payment solutions. So um, I talked about ISOs dying and I wanna make a little distinction that there are a few different kinds of ISOs. They're, they're, they generally are categorized into retail and wholesale. Um, the retail is the more common model. That was what initially came about to help the processors scale and reach, reach different parts of the market. Um, they're focused on sales. Um, they don't do underwriting or much underwriting or risk management, no chargebacks, um, not much in the terms of integrations um, and no autonomy. They're really an outsourced sales force. That model pro also provides the, the least amount of value to companies now. Um, who are looking for more service, tighter uh, customer integrations, things like that. Um, so the, I, the retail ISOs, a lot of times they will get more involved and they will build functionality platforms to take on more functions. Um, instead of just being a sales arm, they can offer operational and customer support. Um, they can perform some underwriting. Uh, sometimes they, uh, they, do, they manage the risk, they have chargeback responsibility, um, so they'll, they'll take some risk there um, with an acquiring bank overseeing them, of course. You have to have a sponsor bank. Um, they have some autonomy, but one distinction is they cannot settle the funds. They're not allowed to move the money to, the, to their merchants. That still remains the responsibility of the, um, of the sponsor bank. So overall, these models were in use for, for a long time, but they're falling out of favor for sure as technology becomes forefront and the most important thing to, to the clients. Uh, the referral model. Um, so this is the throw them over the wall to a payment provider model. Uh, the original integrated payments. Um, 
the, the, the clients can, can have a mix of service from this where they, um, they could get rejected um, for, for unknown reasons. Sometimes the communication is poor. Um, the, the software platform that has referred someone over to a payment provider um, often has very poor visibility uh, to what's going on. Um, it's, it's one way that you can provide payment processing to, to your clients, um, but it's really not a very good way because you lose control. You have no liability, so no risk. You might even get a revenue share uh, for this model um, because they'll give you a kickback. They, uh, the payment provider can offer a, um, a revenue share from the money they're making, but it's a percentage of their profits. Um, and you have no control, no ownership, no visibility, um, and can experience poor customer service. Um, this is probably the number one reason we hear people wanting to be payment facilitators, wanting to change their model is because they're tired of this. Um, it, it may have worked initially, but they realize, oh, we these are our customers on our platform. Uh, we wanna own the entire relationship, not have a third party in there um, that we can't see what's happening and we can't control it at all. Um, so let's draw this out here. I wanna show a, a depiction of what happens um, in the traditional payments ecosystem. So here's, this is definitely some one-on-one -on -one material. Um, a consumer uses their credit card at a merchant. Um, that merchant um, has to have a connection to the acquiring bank and the um, a processor. Um, there could be an ISO in there. There could be some other entity like a gateway of, of that they're coded to to get that transaction to the acquiring bank and processor. That bank submits it through the card networks um, and that gets to the issuing bank. The issuing bank approves the transaction. They're going to settle the funds and, and the funds go from the consumer's bank, the issuing bank to the acquiring bank. And then the acquiring bank and processor fund the merchant. So that's the entire um, card payments ecosystem right there. One, one easy picture, very easy to understand. Um, the new, newer model uh, that has emerged is what we call the embedded payments ecosystem. And here we have a, this entrant, the embedded payment provider. Um, and this may be a software platform. It could be a marketplace. Um, it's an entity that is, is really uh, knows that customer well, knows that merchant well. If they're a software platform, they know their clients really well. If it's a vertical focused software, um, they, they know every detail. They have the data, right? That's the great thing about software is you have all the data of what's going on on the platform. Um, they serve that function of taking the transaction to the acquiring bank and processor so that acquiring bank is, is not going anywhere. They are still in the picture. They submit the transaction to the issuer. Um, the issuer pays the acquiring bank. And then the payment embedded payment provider has the responsibility um, and ability, the control to fund the merchant. So it's, it's another, it's another um, provider in here that is providing better service and functionality to the end merchant. Hey, Ted, we have a question. I'll let you catch your breath for a second. Oh, sure. <laughs> and um, a question, interchange rate versus discount rate, are they additive? Are they additive? Um, yeah. No, no, the interchange rate is what the issuer is charging. And that is one component of the discount rate. So, so the discount rate is, uh, let's say, let's say um, 3%. Um, that 3% that a merchant pays to process a credit card, a component of that, a pretty large component of that um, is, is the interchange rate that goes to the issuing bank. There are other fees that make up the discount rate, um, such as the network fees um, and the processor fees um, for their work that they're doing to make that, that transaction happen. So I would say that um, the interchange is a part of the discount rate. The discount rate is what the merchant pays. Um, they may or may not have full visibility to what the interchange is on any particular transaction. Um, it's just a major component of cost of, of running a transaction. 
Um, I mean, I suppose also someone could, if they wanted to charge a discount rate and be underwater, um, you know, that their the payment provider somehow is covering that interchange that has to be paid. So they're they're not really one to one, but I, I consider an interchange a component, a cost component that is usually covered by the discount rate the merchant pays. So let's see um, the embedded payments models. So a software platform um, has a lot of choices of how they want to do those, the payments. They, they could work with an ISO. Um, they could be an ISO. They could um, have that, that old um, that referral model um, and throw them over the wall to somebody. Um, but there are some better options that are emerging that offer that, that offer the control flexibility and, and revenue for the software platform. Um, the ownership and control brings better revenue um, and it avoids lock-in because this, this ecosystem is changing all the time. Um, software is changing all the time. The needs of the market and the merchants are changing. And so what we really feel strongly is that people don't get locked into one model, um, invest, you know, put all your eggs in one basket. Um, you want to maintain the control. So the marketplaces, I'm going to go into these in, in a little more detail. Marketplaces represent, um, the, they're represented as the seller of multiple merchants goods with one checkout. Um, there's a model that uh, people call PF Lite or managed payment facilitators or hybrid, um, which is, it, it provides some advantages over a referral model. Um, but the merchant, the, there are different variables there. Um, and then the final one, the payment facilitator model has the most control, uh, most responsibility um, that is passed from the, uh, the acquiring bank onto the registered payment facilitator. So they perform a lot of the, the business functions like underwriting and managing risk. So marketplaces. Um, they are represented as the, as the customer, to the customer as the seller of the merchant's goods. Um, so the marketplace doesn't actually own the goods or services typically. Um, they have one checkout, so you could buy things from multiple retailers with one checkout. Um, and there is a single, the single payment process for multiple sellers. So they have to move the funds. They collect the funds uh, from the uh, credit or debit card, right, from the, the issuing bank. Um, and then they need to split it out and pay multiple people. So they're, they're moving the funds to, to multiple merchants. So they are, are in this new embedded payments model and have to manage the underwriting and the risk. Um, there are some rules around this that the card networks have set up. One is that they have to, um, the, the, the name of the marketplace has to be displayed more prominently than the brands or the retailers. Um, and, and that includes if it's part of a mobile application or the URL um, that has to have the name of the marketplace. Um, you know, good example of a marketplace, most people know, Amazon, right? Um, there are multiple retailers that, but you're buying, you're doing your transaction with Amazon um, in that single checkout. Now, there's this um, area of PF Lite, managed payment facilitators. Um, and it's a spectrum because there are so many different models out there, so many different companies providing solutions here. Um, there's no one single way to explain it. But I like to think of it as a spectrum of on the far side here, um, the, the, the software platform has no liability, no risk, um, but then they also have no control. Um, so they can, um, that maybe they get a customized merchant application, um, instant onboarding, faster onboarding than the old referral model because the software, the technology platform is connected all the way through to the processor. So it's an improvement over the um, referral model. Um, they have no liability, but they also, it's still not their merchant. It's still not their contract. Um, they don't really make the decision of which merchants can be accepted and onboarded and which ones aren't. So it's an improvement. There's more visibility, but still not, still, still it's a lot like the referral model. So be aware 
um, of, of how, how much of an improvement this is. Maybe there's a technology integration improvement. Maybe there's a little customer experience improvement, but in general on that managed payment facilitator side of the equation um, of the spectrum, um, they, they, the software platform still doesn't have control of their merchants. Um, then there, there's a, this, on this spectrum, there are some providers out there that give more control. Um, they say, hey, you can, you can bring the merchant application. You, can, um, you should do the underwriting and manage your risk. So we're gonna give you liability. And that way, if you take liability, you need to have the tools in place to manage um, the onboarding. And you have, you have to make sure that you know who that merchant is. So you do the KYC, you do that, that uh, risk and compliance checking. Um, and then you get, to, you get a larger revenue share for that. You, you may, the more risk you take on, the more work you do, the more you're going to make on the payment program in general. So um, the provider may manage certain things like compliance. They may have the contract with the merchant um, because it's their, it's their uh, risk at the end of the day. Um, and where we've seen this be a good model and it works pretty well is for global programs where a software wants to really scale globally, but they don't want to invest in um, building a, a separate, setting up a separate entity in every single country. So they get this, they get a lot of the benefit of being a full payment facilitator without the work of, of setting that up in every single country. So these options are out there. And number one, number one advice would be um, manage, if you, if you have risk, if you have liability for that merchant and for the transactions, make sure you have control. Those two should go together. Um, it can be managed and there's more revenue. The more control you have, the more risk you take, um, the, the more ownership you have, the more revenue potential there is. And that's really, that's this, this last model, payment facilitator. Um, you, it's, it's, you put in the work to set up the program, to manage it. You have a merchant application that's yours, the data is yours, the underwriting, the onboarding, the pricing, the risk is yours, but that also means you collect all the revenue. You need a sponsor, um, an acquiring bank sponsor still, um, but the payment facilitator rule um, from the card brand says that it can be a two-party agreement between the payment facilitator and the merchant. That means you own the contract. It means you own that relationship. And that's important for that control. If you wanna change processors down the road, if you wanna change gateways, if you wanna introduce some new feature or function like these embedded uh, finance tools, buy now, pay later, you're already doing that work. You're doing the underwriting, you know your customer um, and you, have, you own the contract. So you have control now to add more things. That's the benefit of having that control. Um, the payment facilitator, according to the network rules, um, it can, can really be invisible to the customer. The sub-merchant is the one representing as selling the goods. So that's different. That's what really separates this from that marketplace model um, that is also an embedded payments solution, but it's, it's different in who is represented to the buyer um, as, as being the merchant. Um, the payment facilitator sets the fees, has the liability, and gets the full discount rate as their revenue. So that's an accounting rule um, that when you're doing those things, you get to recognize that top line revenue. Um, and then, then something that there's a lot of misinformation out there about what it takes to become a full payment facilitator. And one thing that I see so often written in, written all over the place is it says, oh, watch out, you have to, if you're going to move the funds to your sub merchants, you have to have a money transmitter license which is a very, very expensive and arduous thing to do in every state, um, but it's actually not required um, if you are a payment facilitator. Uh, we, Infinicept has a solution with our processors where uh, basically um, we, uh, we enable the payment facilitator to create funding instructions, and then we send those instructions to the processor or the, the acquiring bank, the sponsor bank, um, who then they move the money and they already have all the money transfer licenses. So that's actually not something that the payment facilitator has to do. They can simply rely on the money transmitter capabilities of their sponsor bank and processor. 
So um, I wanted to call that out there that you have control over the fee setting, the funding, the liability. Um, this ownership and control gives payment facilitators the most flexibility for future growth and changes. Um, add, adding on new, it's a foundation for adding on these new value, value added solutions like buy now, pay later and lending. Um, the, who knows what's next? But if you're doing the, if you're doing that, that underwriting, managing the risk, and you have that full visibility and you're funding, you're creating the funding instructions for the submergents, it puts you in a position for the future to do a lot more things. And um, that wraps it up. Um, well, there's one more question I see about a uh, cap on interchange rate, how high the interchange can be. I do believe there are a lot of, there are different rules for that for um, debit in particular. Um, but I think we should, we'll, that we could spend, <laughs> we could spend an hour just talking about um, interchange caps and, and when it applies. So that'd probably be better something that you could reach out to and we'll, we'll talk about one-on-one. Um, -on -one. Any other questions? I've got, I've got one more here. Um, can all ISOs sponsor banks also sponsor Payfax? And then where do you find a list of um, Payfax sponsors? Okay. Um, so the answer to that is, is not really. So there are a lot of sponsor banks of ISOs because that model has been out there for, for 30 some years. Um, a lot of banks got into that. They know how to sponsor ISOs. They know exactly what to do. And with ISOs, the bank, that sponsor bank still really stays in control. It's their contract. It, they are moving the money. They feel that they can really control and provide the right oversight to their ISOs. The payment facilitator model requires some additional controls and oversight and visibility and tools for sponsor banks. If they're going to sponsor a payfac, um, they have to have some additional things in place uh, to properly manage the risk and properly manage um, the payment facilitator and make sure they're doing the right things. Um, so there are not as many um, sponsor banks of payfacs as there are for ISOs. So it's not just any old bank can, can sponsor you as a payfac. Um, unfortunately, there's not like one list of all of the sponsor banks um, that, that Visa and MasterCard have allowed to sponsor Payfax. Um, but at Infinicep, this is one of the things that we help our clients with is, is navigating that ecosystem. There are a lot of times the processor has a sponsor bank behind them um, that has all of the tools and procedures in place to properly manage Payfax. And, this, and the processor is the one that really um, does that work of gathering the information the, to, to make the approval on behalf of the sponsor bank um, procedurally. So, so there's, it, it's a little bit of a different ecosystem. I'd say it's more organized. It's more connected um, to allow the payment facilitator model uh, to, be, to be deployed in a, in a responsible way. Okay. So the ISOs, yeah, just to, so many banks sponsor ISOs, only a handful really sponsor the payment facilitators. Okay. Um, I've got a couple more questions here. Um, first, um, when you are referring to risk, what are the sources of risk, non-payment, fraud, what else? What percent, it, what percent of payments historically go unpaid? Well, what we see is it's typically less than one basis point of risk that, that merchants have. If they're in a particularly high risk business where they're taking payment, um, and this is, this is one definition of high risk, you're taking payment for something and you're not delivering the service or the product until uh, far in the future, that's a high risk because there's a high risk for chargeback. Um, if, con consumer, if the consumer doesn't feel like they got what they paid for, they have the right to submit a chargeback. Um, so that's where the issuing bank then requests the money back from the acquiring bank. Um, less than one basis point is what we see um, is, the, is the risk. And that, can, that is managed because of a couple things. One is making sure that the business is responsible 
and delivering the product or service that they're charging for. Um, the, the other is properly underwriting um, and evaluating the merchants before you give them the ability to take payments. So, so what, we, what, what we help our, our clients with, our platform, for example, um, has the ability to do underwriting upfront to properly vet the merchant before you grant them the ability to process payments. Um, and then an ongoing monitoring of their transactions to make sure that everything is in line with what they told you and what you expect them to be doing in terms of the, um, the volume, the transaction limits, the transaction amounts, the hours of the day, um, lots of details help determine if this is a valid transaction or not. So it's um, the, the risk, the probably risk number one um, is, is that it's a legitimate company. So that's what you do the underwriting up front for is to make sure that they're not just a bogus made up fraudulent company that wants to uh, run a lot of transactions and then disappear. That's risk number one. Risk number two is the chargeback, is that the consumer at the end of the day says, wait a minute, I didn't pay for that. Um, and they do a chart, they initiate a chargeback. Um, so those are the two, com the two main components of risk um, when you're in the payments business. And it has a chain of command where it, it, it starts out, the, the, the merchant has the risk, um, then if the merchant goes away and they disappear, um, the payment facilitator has the risk uh, or, the, or the ISO or embedded payments company that, that has liability. And then if they go away or there's some massive problem there, the acquiring bank has the risk. So that's the chain. That's why acquiring banks have to approve the payfax and the payfax have to approve the merchants. And then the merchant's job is to take the payments. Uh, from consumers. So I hope that answered that question. Uh, yeah, and what we've got one more actually. Um, okay. What is the most important conversation when picking the right model for you? Oh, that's a that's a good question. Um, most important conversation, I I think, is um, understanding um, understanding your business and where you want to go. Um, this, you know, the reason that, that I see people want more control, um, it's not always for that top line revenue. It's not always because they can, um, you know, really increase their revenue. A lot of times it's about the customer experience. It's that they feel that they want to own that relationship with their, with their customers. Um, they know them the best and they want to have the ability for their customer service reps if one of, their, one of their clients calls because of some issue with their software or they call because of some issue with the payment, they want that to be a one-stop shop. They want to be able to have their customer service reps answer payment questions as well as functionality questions. Um, so I'd say the most important conversation uh, is, is what, what do you want to get? What's your What's your business goal? You know, are you just trying to grow revenue? Are you trying to provide the best customer service out there? What's your strategy to do that? And that can help you decide what model is right for you. Um, if, if you're not as interested in the control and don't want to put the work in and don't want to manage payments, well, then you can choose one of the, the, the Payfac Lite programs um, where you can get a revenue share but not do any of the work. But then you're losing out on the control on the experience. You're, you're outsourcing that to somebody else who's gonna be interacting with your customer. So I think that strategy strategy is really important for, for the decision. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, I don't see any more questions. Um, yeah. It looks like looks like we're good. So, but before everyone leaves, just want to remind everyone that we, this is the first in a series of webinars that we're doing. Um, we've got three more coming up. You'll see them on the screen, and I think um, probably registered for them as well when you register for this one. And then also, um, there were some questions about whether we're recording this session. We are. It will be on our website. And then also for everyone who attended, we'll follow up with um, a Payments 101 ebook that we have that, that is in line with the presentation that Ted, Ted went through today. Um, and then 
any questions, anything else that we can help you out with, or um, if there was anything that we didn't get answered, um, please, please reach out. We're here, we're here to help and here to answer any questions. And thanks, Ted. I mean, every time I listen to that, I, I learned something new. Well, great. <laughs> it was a great, great presentation. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thanks, everyone.